When King Henry VIII popped the question, Catherine Parr felt slightly sick. This twice-widowed 31-year-old was no fool. She'd been brought up in court circles. Her mother had been a lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife. She knew Henry's backstory. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, what would become of her? If only he'd wanted her as his mistress, she could lie with him and think, well, not of England, but of the man she'd fallen in love with the previous year, the dashing and charismatic Thomas Seymour. But the king was intent on making her his bride. So on the 12th of July, 1543, at Hampton Court Palace, Catherine Parr was wedded. The 52-year-old king was in very poor health. Grossly obese, his unhealed leg wounds, which he got from sword jousting, seeped pus so odorous they said you could smell him from three rooms away. The marriage started off quite well. Thankfully, Thomas Seymour had set off on adventures abroad. Henry enjoyed showing off his new bride with her lovely face, her gorgeous golden locks and obvious sex appeal. He lavished gifts on her, beautiful gowns and jewels, and quite a lot of land. He also valued her intelligence and education. She spoke French, Italian, and was perfecting her Latin. She even published two religious books during her marriage. Henry's children lived separate lives in different households and didn't really have much to do with the king. Mary was 27 years old, Elizabeth was 10, and Edward was just five. But Catherine became a friend and mother figure to them. She even persuaded Henry to reinstate both Mary and Elizabeth's right to the succession of the throne, after previously having been declared illegitimate. Henry probably never dreamt that they would both become Queens of England. King Henry respected Catherine so much that the following year, when he went on a military campaign to France, he appointed her regent in charge of his children and of the country. Upon his return, he congratulated her on doing a grand job. Catherine was always careful to do her duty in bed, to flatter and care for her ailing husband. But in 1546, after two and a half years of wedded bliss, the marriage started to falter. Both Henry and Catherine enjoyed their spirited conversations on philosophy and religion, but the gap between their beliefs was wide. Catherine was a firm Protestant and spoke out boldly in favour of religious reform, but she often overstepped the mark as far as Henry was concerned. One might think, what was the problem? Surely this king, who split from the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church, who closed down all the monasteries and tortured to death some of the priests, surely he would appreciate a wife with reformed Protestant views? Actually, no. Thirty years previously, much of Northern Europe had been influenced by Martin Luther's rejection of the Roman Catholic Church. But that had been about religious principles and church practices and beliefs. King Henry's reformation of the English church was all about his sex drive. He was going to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne Boleyn, and no one was going to stop him. Henry remained a Roman Catholic. He took Catholic mass. He still believed that when he took bread and wine, he was actually consuming the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And even though he kicked out the monks and nuns and paid them off, he insisted that they remained celibate. Yet he had started a religious reformation in his country. He just wanted the changes to be slow and to suit his own kingly design. Unsurprisingly, there was a lot of unrest in the country. Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester, was the priest who officiated at Henry and Catherine's wedding. He was a Catholic traditionalist and he didn't like Catherine's Protestant beliefs nor her influence over the king one bit. He'd heard her spouting her Protestant nonsense. There was a law that allowed noble women to study the English Bible, but only in private. But Gardner, he'd seen Catherine huddled together with her favourite lady companions, reading it aloud. His plot to discredit Catherine in the eyes of her husband began. He filled Henry's mind with stories of Protestant heretics. 
And in May 1546, the king gave him permission to arrest a large group of them. One was a 25-year-old writer and poet called Anne Askew. She was committed to Protestant reform. Her Catholic husband had kicked her out of her house where they lived with their two children. She had moved to London to preach her Protestant beliefs there. Now she was being arrested for the third time. Bishop Gardner seized his chance. Here was another educated, fervent Protestant, another writer, another woman with links to the royal court. This would be his route to discredit the Queen. But Anne Askew refused to renounce her Protestant beliefs. So Gardner and the Lord Chancellor, Thomas Risley, took her to the Tower of London. They instructed the constable of the tower to tie Anne Askew to the rack. But the constable didn't want to do it. It was illegal to torture a woman. So Risley flung off his gown and worked the rack himself. Give me the names of other Protestant women. I know of none. The handle turned. Renounce, they cried. Speak the words. She fainted. They revived her. The handle turned again. Who is in league with you? Which ladies are involved with you or share your beliefs? There is none. Which gentlewomen have given you money? There is none. The handle turned again and her joints were ripped from their sockets. Her screams pierced the air. Still, she wouldn't confess. I will not. I would rather die. After a spell in Newgate Prison, she was condemned as a heretic. On the 16th of July, 1546, she was carried in a chair, physically broken, to Smithfield Market. They tied her body to a stake and set fire to her. Her executioner did show one morsel of compassion by hanging a bag of gunpowder to her neck to speed up the process. After Anne Askew's execution, Gardner requested a meeting with the king. And there he managed to persuade Henry that Queen Catherine's Protestant views and writings were undermining the stability of the state. For Henry, the honeymoon period was over. His leg pains were worsening. The novelty of his wife had started to wane. He'd begun to tire of Catherine's forthright views. And what's more, they'd been married for over two years now with no sign of a baby on the way. He ordered the arrest of his queen and three of her ladies in waiting. But that night, as Catherine opened her door, she found a document that had been accidentally dropped outside. And this tipped her off about what was to happen to her. He collapsed in shock. But when Henry heard that his wife had been taken ill, he visited her in her room and proceeded to question her on her beliefs. Her ladies had already hidden all their heretical Protestant books. Catherine was now fighting for her life. She told her husband, I'm merely a silly, foolish woman. I accept you as my only source of wisdom, the supreme head and governor here on earth, next under God. But the king objected, come on, Catherine, I have heard you. You have spent hours arguing with me in favor of your Protestant beliefs. She then looked her husband in the eye and replied, I only argued with you to take your mind off your painful leg, to provide stimulating conversation, and so I could learn and benefit from your most enlightened replies. At which point, Henry softened and said, Is that really so, my sweetheart? So you were only thinking of me all the time? Then let's make up and be perfect friends again. <laughs> now this was just as well as the next day Henry and Catherine were enjoying a reconciliatory stroll, Chancellor Risley turned up with 40 soldiers to arrest Catherine. But Henry called him an errant knave, a beast and a fool and sent them all packing. And so Catherine survived her reign by playing the role of a submissive wife. But there was no fairy tale ending to her story.
The following year, in January 1547, King Henry VIII died. He left Catherine well provided for in his will, but this time he did not appoint her regent to his son. As Edward, the new king, was just nine years old, his uncle, Edward Seymour, was appointed his regent. In effect, he was now ruling the country. The new king's other uncle happened to be Thomas Seymour, who wasted little time before arriving back in Catherine's life. Their love affair was now consummated and blossomed. Four months later, they were married. Problems then began. Edward, the regent, was furious to discover his brother's secret marriage. He confiscated Catherine's jewel collection Thomas and Catherine were deeply resentful of Edward's power. The falling out was bitter and deep. And then the 13-year-old Princess Elizabeth came to stay. Over the next few months, Catherine was busy trying to finish writing her third book called A Lamentation of a Sinner. She tried to ignore the rumours about Thomas and her stepdaughter Elizabeth. She closed her ears to the laughter and squeals of delight emanating from Elizabeth's room where Thomas seemed to spend so much time. On the day that young Elizabeth was found in Thomas's arms, Catherine had finally had enough. No hard feelings, but uh, Elizabeth was moved out of the marital home. Besides, Catherine was now pregnant. She moved to Sudley Castle in Gloucestershire to prepare for the birth. And on the 30th of August, 1548, she gave birth to Mary Seymour. About six days later, Catherine died and was buried in the castle grounds. There, she rested in peace for over 200 years, forgotten. But then one day, in 1782, a local man stumbled upon her coffin which was just two feet below the earth. He opened it to find the body covered in linen. He pulled away a piece of cloth and inserted a probe in her arm, noting that it was white and moist. Her lead coffin protected her body at first, but as the coffin was opened several more times, her body began to deteriorate. In the 1792, vandals broke into the coffin and danced with her corpse before chucking it onto a rubbish heap. By the time the coffin was last moved, in 1861, to St Mary's Chapel in the grounds of Sudley Castle, Catherine Parr's body was reduced to dust. They created a new Gothic-style tomb and a life-size effigy to remember her by. At last, she lies in peace. Thank you for watching my film on Queen Catherine Parr. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like. If you have any comments, I'd love to hear from you. If you want to hear more fascinating stories of London, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Bye.